Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So, before proceeding further, I would like to mention that uh, there was some serious slip, it seems, I am not very sure. Mm. It is in application of that transformation from surface integral to volume integral. So, I have written something wrong and you have not pointed out, maybe because of non-familiarity with the notation. So, first I will correct that. You know that conversion from surface integral to volume integral is what is commonly called as the divergence theorem is given by integration of any vector, let us say f over the surface of any volume. is divergence of that vector integrated over that volume. The relationship between this volume and area is this area is the surface area of this volume. Okay. <laughs> they are not just any arbitrary area and volume. This volume is enclosed by this surface or su this surface is the surface of this particular volume. So, this is what is the relation and commonly called as divergence theorem or Gauss divergence theorem. Hmm. This is what is called divergence theorem. Also called Gauss theorem. <coughs> Now, this is the rule that we applied while evaluating the moment due to the surface forces. Okay. Now, the surface forces were if you remember yes, look back to your yesterday's note or last class note that the surface force please correct me if I am if I am not using the notations as it was in the last class epsilon i j k R j T k L N L D A integrated over the surface. This part is all right. Okay. This we are applying this divergence theorem. Hmm which resulted or which will result epsilon i j k divergence r j Okay. It seems that perhaps while writing this, I wrote N L also on the, the this right hand side. Hmm. If I wrote N L here, okay, then remove it, because that N L will not be there on this. This comes directly from this this relation. Okay. And because of this NL, the divergence here is with respect to this RL. The divergence is written as RL, hmm. you can <coughs> which is the second subscript for T. <coughs> okay. 
So, that is the only only correction that this n l will not be there. The n represents the normal to the surface. So, the right hand side is not surface integral, it is a volume integral. So, there is no question of that n and that n is being taken care of by this r l. You can see that this has the same subscript what n had which is the again the second subscript of this T k l. Okay. So, that small bit of correction. <laughs> anyway, the result what we found that of course, is not changing because of this. I think in this statement it was a slip that I wrote that n l, but the subsequent steps of course, I did not anyway and the result that we found that the stress tensor is symmetric. Okay. Now, <coughs> I hope or I think it is correct that you have already come across if not stress tensor in direct details, but the moment of inertia tensor that is also another tensor which you have come across earlier. This is a general property of any tensor that if you change your axis system particularly if you rotate the axis system then the element of these tensor will change. Like this stress tensor T k L it has the component T 1 1, T 1 2, T 1 3 and so on. These components will change if you change your axis system particularly if you rotate your axis system. And there is a particular axis axis system with respect to that all the off diagonal terms that is T 1 2, T 1 3 and so on all of them become 0 only the diagonal elements remain. One particular axis system if you go on rotating say you have a particular axis system based on that axis system you have evaluated everything. Think about the moment of inertia which is simply evaluated as something square of the distance into d m and of course, the square of now if you rotate your axis system these elements will change at one particular orientation of the axis system you will find that all of diagonal elements have become 0 only the diagonal elements remain. This particular axis system is called principal axis system. This also I think you have uh, done your earlier mechanics course in connection with stress principal stresses principal strengths you have found. Now, tensors also have a very important property which are known as invariants. A second order tensor has three invariants. A second order tensor means which are mathematically represented by a 3 by 3 matrix has three invariants. Invariant means which do not vary as we rotate our axis system they are called invariants and a second order tensor that is 3 by 3 tensor has three invariants. So, they are called the tensor invariants. So, we have the tensors have principal axis system these are certain properties of all tensors then tensor invariants tensor invariants <coughs> a second order tensor has three tensor invariants three invariants for second order tensor Now, see the tensors are represented by matrix. Okay. The tensors are usually represented by matrix, but you should remember that there is some difference between a matrix and tensor. Since tensors are represented as matrix, so any type of matrix operation that you can perform on matrix that can be performed on the tensors also. The main or the basic differences comes from here the tensor is matrix is just a collection of numbers those numbers do not have any meaning 
how you call it is a matrix, those numbers do not have any meaning, they are just collection of numbers. However, the tensor is a physical quantity, tensor is a physical quantity. So, its elements has a very definite meaning like in this case of stress tensor T i j as you mentioned the T i j represent the force per unit area along i direction acting on a surface which has j its normal. But if you just write a matrix then the numbers whatever they are in the matrix the elements of the matrix they do not have any other meaning they are just number. <coughs> now the three ten tensor invariants of course, the we will be only using the first invariant not the second and third invariant, but since we have mentioned we will tell you what are the three invariants. The first invariance is what is called the trace that is sum of the diagonals it is invariant. That means, as I said that if you rotate your axis system the tensor elements will change there is a particular orientation where no of diagonal elements are there all of diagonal elements are 0 only the diagonal elements are there, but whatever the change is the change will be always such that the sum of the diagonal elements will always remain constant. That is let us say if you have stress tensor each component is representing a force per unit area along a particular direction acting on a particular plane. Those individual component will change if we change on keep on changing our axis system particularly if we keep on rotating. Okay. However, whatever those individual elements are the sum of the diagonal will always remain fixed constant. So, that is the first tensor invariant the trace of the tensor or trace of the matrix representing that particular tensor is always constant that is first is the trace usually denoted by T r trace of T i j is constant that is the trace of T i j is what T i i when I write T i i this index i is repeating. So, it means T 1 1 plus T 2 2 plus T 2 T 3 3 okay. this is constant. T 1 1, T 2 2, T 3 3 all three of them can change, but will change in such a way that the sum will remain constant. The second tensor invariant is that sum of the principal minors is constant, which in this case can be written as say the second invariant. Let us denote this diagonal elements only let us think about this T, T matrix T 1 1 into T 2 2 plus T 2 2 into T 3 3 plus T 3 3 into T 1 1 minus T 1 2 square minus T 2 3 square minus T 3 1 square is constant. This is true for any tensor, not only that is stress tensor, any other tensor like say moment of inertia tensor or strain tensor or any other tensor you which you may come across, it is true for all of them. Whenever is a second order tensor, these the there are three invariants and these are and the third is determinant of the matrix formed by T i j. How do you write uh, say uh, T we have already used for force. So, determinant of let us simply call it determinant instead of writing by any notation because we, we are not going to use it. Determinant of the matrix is also constant, this is the third invariant. So, if you have <coughs> any tensor these are the three invariants of the tensor. <coughs> uh. 
So, when we rotate the axis system, so that the elements of this matrix or the individual stress elements are changing, but the change is such that the sum of the diagonal always remain constant. Now, what are these diagonal elements? If we look to this matrix or let us write the in a matrix form, the stress tensor in the matrix form. The stress tensor if we write in matrix form is T 1 1, T 1 2, T 1 3, T 2 1 which is same as T 1 2. Okay. So, we are not going to write it T 2 1, but we will write as T 1 2, T 2 2, T 2 3, T 3 1 is same as again T 1 3 because of symmetry. So, we will again write T 1 3, T 3 2 is again same as 2 3 and T 3 3. Now, T 1 1 is the force per unit area acting along direction 1 on a surface to which direction 1 is normal. Now, think about say in terms of x y z because that might be little more comfortable to you that is if we think it is T x x then it is x component of the force per unit area of course, acting on a face which is normal to x. So, what is this force? This is a no force normal to that plane. So, these all these diagonal components they are they represent normal stresses, normal stresses the stress which is normal to the face on which it is acting. The others are T 1 2, we can say very easy it is it might be easier to comprehend using a two dimensional element. In a two dimension an element is simply say a simple rectangle will make a smaller rectangle instead of making such a big rectangle. Let us say this for your convenience we said x y. So, the T x x will be in this direction acting on this face this because x is normal to this face also to this face. The direction it might be along this or along this we are not worried about the direction at this stage whether it is towards the face or away from the face, <laughs> but this is normal to the face. What about T 1 2? You can see that that will be something like this. Okay. So, if we call this T 1 1, this x is 1, y is 2. <laughs> now, <laughs> so these up diagonal elements are all tangential stress also commonly called as shear stress and the diagonal terms are the normal stress and you know that normal stresses are either tension or compression. The normal stresses are either tension or compression and the up diagonal elements are also at tangential stress or shear stress. So, diagonal elements they represent normal stress. of diagonal elements <coughs> tangential stress or shear stress. Now, with this we will see what is the meaning of the definition that we initially proposed for 
or fluids. We defined fluid or substances which cannot withstand any tendency by applied forces to deform it in such a way that uh, leaves the volume unchanged. <coughs> or other way that if we apply a force, then fluids are those substances which would not be able to the tendency of this force to deform it without changing the volume. That means, it can withstand, but in that process it has to change its volume. Without changing the volume, it cannot deform. No such deformation is possible which will leave its volume unchanged. When a force is applied, okay, it will deform, all right, but the deformation will be such that the volume will not remain unchanged, the volume has to change. That is the definition we proposed for fluid and we will see what is the meaning of that in terms of this stress. For that, first of all we will consider this fluid is at rest. Okay. Let us consider fluid at rest and for simplicity, so we will call stress tensor, we will, would like to see how the stress tensor is for fluid at rest. For convenience, let us consider a spherical element. Consider a spherical element sufficiently small, okay. this fluid element is sufficiently small so that we can consider the stress tensor is more or less uniform. We can assume, we will later on see what it is, but <coughs> we will assume that a small fluid element, spherical element, so that the stress tensor remain more or less uniform and we will choose the principal axis system for stress. Okay. That we can choose without losing any generality, that we are choosing only the principal set of axis, set of principal axis system, so that the stress tensor contain only diagonal element. Okay. So, consider again principal axis system, so the stress tensor is what we have already you know that we have written all T 1 1 0 0 0 T 2 2 0 0 0 T 3 3 and to make that this is principal system and uh, different from the other let us denote a prime okay. that these are now the principal stresses. However, we know that this is an invariant T i i equal to constant. Once again T i i means T 1 1 plus T 2 plus T 3 3 and that is constant means the same is T 1 1 prime plus T 2 prime plus T 3 3 prime. Okay. So, this implies that for any condition T 1 1 plus T 2 2 plus T 3 3 equal to T 1 1 prime plus T 2 2 prime plus T 3 3 prime. Okay. <laughs> now, we would like to write this stress as sum of two stress tensor sum of two stress tensors that is we would like to write 
let us write it explicitly instead of using any notation. Very simple. So, if we say that this is the stress that is acting on the fluid, we can say that that means these two stresses are acting on it, in which in one case we have made it one third of the sum and the whatever is left out that we have to consider as a second stress, stress system. Now, look to this first stress system, what it is? This is equal in all direction. This is a, this has a spherical symmetry or isotropic behavior equal in all direction. <coughs> and since all are same, this means that all three are either tension or compression. As it happens, then it is actually compression. That is what fluid can take at rest. It cannot take tension. Anyway, so, but all three are same. Our experience says that this is compression, that all three are compression. Now, what happens if that type of stress is applied on a fluid element, a spherical element in which an isotropic compression is applied, equal amount of compression in all direction? So, volume will change. In case of compression, it will be compressed, volume will decrease. So, this deformation resulting in change in volume. So, according to our definition, this is permitted. That is, an isotropic state of compression is allowed. Our definition of fluid permits it. Now, look to the second one. <coughs> we will call it say this, uh, denote it say 1 and So, one represent isotropic, we are calling it compression from our so this is deformation with change in volume, deform it which is permissible by, so satisfies the definition. Satisfy the definition, definition of fluid that we have proposed. <coughs> now, look to the second one. The sum of this diagonal or the stress of this matrix is 0. If you sum the diagonal, it becomes 0. And then what, what does it mean? All three are normal stresses and some of the normal stresses are 0. Obviously, it implies that at least one, at least one is tension and at least one is compression. The third one may be either tension or compression. All three cannot be same at least one is tension, at least one is compression and the third one might be either of the two. So, that 
the sum becomes 0. <coughs> now, if this type of force is applied on a spherical element, what will happen? In one axis, along one axis you are applying a tension, along another axis you are applying a compression and along the third axis you are applying either a tension or compression, such that the sum total of this tension and compression is 0. Yes? Volume, volume will not change, because the sum total of the compression and tension is 0. So, the total volume will remain unchanged, but as far as the deformation, deformation will occur. What type of uh, shape the sphere will become? Ellip ellipsoid. The sphere will not become cylindrical, it will become ellipsoid. You have uh, stresses from all three directions. So, this second part imposes that the deformation will be such that there will be no change in volume. And our definition of fluid does not permit that, meaning that the second part of the stress will not be possible, that will not exist in a fluid at rest. Hmm. So, right, the second part sum of diagonals or sum of normal stress the result sum of normal stress is 0, no change in volume at least one is compression. at least one is tension <coughs> the third is either of the two. So, deformation is sphere to ellipsoid deformation without change in volume. So, not allowed by the definition that we have <coughs> So, what is the meaning of this then that when a fluid is at rest the stress system has to be isotropic equal in all direction and as it happens this is compression and it is all axis system or principal axis system. All axis system or principal axis system for a fluid at rest all system axis system or principal axis of stress and at any point at any point the stress is only isotropic compression that is equal from all side a compression equal from all side from all direction and all directions are principal direction. As it happens this isotropic st stress is compression a fluid at rest cannot take tension. <laughs> so, for fluid at rest stress is sorry isotropic in nature
only normal stresses act all axis are principal axis of stress and <coughs> we can write the stress system the stress tensor and <coughs> in the second term delta i j is written to make it a mathematically compatible equation because one third T i i is just a number. This T i j represent a tensor but one third T i i is just a number, one third of T 1 1 plus T 2 2 plus T 3 3. So, this delta i j is given, so that <coughs> it has the tensor form <coughs> and this one third T i i, since it is equal in all direction, we do not need to write all the time T i i and all, we can just write one number which you have written here p and call this as fluid static pressure. Perhaps the word hydrostatic pressure is more familiar to you because say water was perhaps the most common fluid or studied most the fluid that has been studied most and pressure and all these things were usually encountered with water. So, since long this pressure is referred to usually as hydrostatic pressure, but we are making it more general fluid static pressure. So, this is the definition then of static fluid pressure that it is one third of the sum of the normal stresses acting on a fluid at rest. <laughs> I think you have come across another definition of pressure in your thermodynamics, I do not know whether you had a formal course on thermodynamics or not, but you might have a course on kinetic theory in school physics and in that context you defined something called pressure coming because of the collision and momentum transport okay. may not be in that details, but because of that collisions the so called properties of the substance or in that case perhaps you studied only gas which is also fluid. So, properties of fluid particularly the pressure and temperature all are basically manifestation of those molecular motion and their collision. So, that is the thermodynamic pressure. This you have got something based on a stress consideration or let us say dynamic or mechanics consideration. So, this is that is a thermodynamic pressure, this is a mechanical pressure. 
is there any relationship between the two? Okay, we will not answer that question now, we will leave it for later, but we will uh, later on come at what is the difference between this pressure and that pressure or is there at all any difference or both are same, but this of course, we will discuss little later. <laughs> So, now the <coughs> definition of that fluid that we initially postulated has become clear that what we intended as a definition of the fluid is that the stress system for fluid at rest must be only an isotropic compression <coughs> and that is what is the implication of that definition that fluid while at rest takes only an isotropic compression. Now, let us move on to the equilibrium. We have already discussed that two forces are acting in general on a fluid at bulk. If we consider a certain bulk amount of fluid, there are two forces acting on it and when the fluid is at rest, of course, these two forces must balance each other the body force and the surface force. So, <coughs> say for fluid at rest in equilibrium, or equilibrium consideration of because at rest is a, has to be in equilibrium. So, that is actually super superfluous when you say fluid at rest in equilibrium, at rest has to be in equilibrium. So, you, we are considering now equilibrium condition. Now, the forces acting the body force, how much is the total body force? Consider a fluid of volume V which is bounded by a surface, then what is the total body force acting on it? Hmm? Total body force is, we have already defined the body force to be rho f d v. So, when this is integrated over the entire volume, this gives the total body force. Let us call this to be capital F and it is if you want you can use even this vector notation otherwise you can forget. <coughs> and the total surface force acting on the same fluid total surface force acting on the same fluid, how much it is? Yes. Now, it should be straightforward to write that. Earlier we have written it already tau y j n j d a, but now tau y j n j is has a special meaning. The tau y j we have got a definite value. Hmm? Yes. Mm 
the tau ij has become minus p, the tau ij has become now minus p. So, you can simply write that p. integrated over the surface which encloses this volume V and again we can apply this divergence theorem because these are these you need to equate we need to balance. So, they should be of same type of quantity. So, this becomes in terms of volume integral what it is? and since the fluid is at rest the sum of these two forces is 0. remember there is something about the volume this V. The surface or this volume since we are considering in the first relation itself the total body force is V integrated over this volume that means this volume must be entirely within the fluid you cannot consider a volume which is partly in fluid and partly not. The volume must be such that it is entirely within the fluid. <coughs> And since this relation is general for any arbitrary volume, we can say that the integrand itself is 0. So, that is or to give our notation this f is a vector. So, we will write in vector notation rho f i oh, this is plus and as you know that the body force is often the gravitational force that is this f is g and you can have your axis system aligned in such a way that the g has only one component. In that case see this is actually representing three small differential equation for each i equal to 1 2 3 it represent three small differential equation d p d x 1 equal to rho f 1 and so on. And you can choose your axis system particularly when the body force is simply gravitational force and you know it is a you know only in one direction. So, you can make align your axis along with that. So, that only one equation will have a non zero right hand side the other two equations will have 0 right hand side. <coughs> Now, for those cases where the body force F is a potential function or conservative force field, let us say for conservative force field,
let's write this or your Where psi is what? The potential energy per unit mass, the potential function, is not it? The potential energy associated, potential energy per unit mass associated with this conservative field. <coughs> and if we put it here, then what do we get? For conservative force field, the equation then become okay, write this gradient notation <coughs> if we take a curl of this you are familiar with this operator curl so, if we take a curl of it, what will be the result? If we take the curl of it, what will be the result? Curl of a gradient. Curl of a gradient is always zero. Curl of a gradient is always zero. The curl usually written in that this fashion. The minus, of course, we can take it. and this further becomes Now, see starting from this equation, if we start from this equation, this equation indicates that there will be certain surfaces on which the pressure will remain same. If we consider a fluid under different condition, then there will be certain surfaces on which the pressure will remain constant and so will be density these surfaces we may call it level surface because the pressure is same on that. So, there are level surfaces for pressure similarly level surfaces for density and also level surfaces for psi. Psi as we mentioned that this psi function represents potential energy power unit mass associated with this particular this force field. Again, you know that on us there are surfaces on which the potential energy is fixed. Like think if you think in terms of the gravitational potential, which is measured from the center of the earth. So, at any fixed alti altitude, the potential energy will remain same, which is not exactly a horizontal surface. If you think in terms of the earth, it is a spherical surface. So, similarly this there are level surface for pressure, there are level surface of density and there are level surface for potential energy and 
looking to the last equation this car gradient of rho cross gradient of psi equal to 0 what does it mean gradient the result of gradient operator is always a vector. So, gradient of rho is a vector, gradient of psi is a vector. So, this two cross product is cross product of two vector is 0, what is that? Ah. So, that means this says that level surface of density and level surface of this potential energy they will coincide. the last relation has the meaning that the level surface of density and level surface of this gravitational or the potential energy will coincide. Also, the first relation or the first relation on this page, this this gives one more information that the level surface of pressure is normal to the reaction of the body force. Level surface of pressure is normal to the body force that comes from this equation. Level surface of pressure is normal to the body force. 